We want to look at soil health uh, principles of grazing system. We want to identify management strategies to integrate soil health into grazing systems. We want to look at the impact of grazing on soil health and function of the soils, and then understand uh, stocking density as its importance uh, to soil health, and also understand grazing principles that improve soil health. So let's talk about how grazing impacts soil health. We have positive benefits, of course, from the manure, from the managed grazing. In fact, I just want to go off script a little bit. We recently looked at some CREP. CREP is, uh, you know, kind of like CRP, and it was an enhancement payment on Greg Brand's farm. And so there's no cattle on it. But he has mowed it, and he does things like that. So we put some underwear in the soil at zero to three inches, and showed a little activity, Kenny, but not a lot. Then we went into his grazing systems, and we saw differences where his phosphorus was at optimum level, his pH was optimum level, that means the soil biology was at optimum level. The underwear literally disappeared, except for the nylon, in 30 days, where the others, they just had a few holes in it. So bringing that pH up, phosphorus levels, things like that, Getting it up, and Greg hadn't fertilized, I don't guess, in about 12 years. So once you get your levels up, the, the pasture management itself will maintain a lot of this. But we want to look at the benefits of manure, managed grazing, positive and negative on urine, negative on uh, poor grazing management. Here's just a slide of what we would like to do, turn the cattle or the sheep or the livestock in at a certain height, take half, leave half, or whatever you all recommend here, but we want to allow for those roots. And uh, in that bottom picture there, you can see the roots. We need that recovery time and to take uh, advantage of photosynthesis collected by that leaf area. And then those roots will exude uh, exudates, that is carbon, for the soil biology. So we want that to function properly. <clears throat> And this is just a design here showing uh, you have your water system. Apparently, that missed a slide. Let me go back. There you go. So you have, a, you have a system there where you have your water system. I heard out in the hallway, a lot of you are talking about your water system. And however you lay out your fences, you want that where you can have your paddocks, where you can have good control of your grazing management where you're making decisions and not the bovine or the sheep or the uh, goats making the decisions on when to graze. And then in the winter time, you can uh, move those fences uh, toward water and as long as you're not repeating it. Uh, Greg, Greg and other grazing land specialists says you don't want to back fence unless uh, maybe three days. You don't want uh, the grass uh, grazed after th three days. And so there's a system of showing that in, in the grazing system. So I want to show you some research at University of Kentucky. They do a pretty good job with uh, grazing information. And this is a four-year-old field of Benchmark Plus. So three cutting heights, four inches, two inches, and a half inch. And then four fertilizer rates, got zero N, zero K, 60 N, 0K, and then uh, 0 in and 100 pounds of potassium, and then 60 pounds of nitrogen and 100 pounds of potassium. And as you can see in this slide, uh, after 30 days, the half inch that was cut was 60 pounds of nitrogen, 100 pounds of potassium is much shorter than your 4 inch with 0 nitrogen and 0 potassium. So what that is showing is is the height of grass where we grazed it to has more importance than the nutrients. And so it takes grass to grow grass. Another slide showing here, again, four inches with 60 pounds of nitrogen, 100 pounds of potassium, you had good recovery. Two inches with 60 pounds of nitrogen, 100 pounds of potassium, you see a lot less recovery. And then down to the half inch, 60 pounds and 100 pounds, again, it's the height of grass more important than the nutrients on recovery. We see on weed percentage, after uh, the fourth harvest, 
another thing showing the same indication. As you have half inch, two inch, you have much more weed percentage than you do four inches. So the height that we end up with and start a recovery has a lot to do with how fast the grass recovers and also our weed pressures because when you overgraze, you tend to get the gram more bare and uh, temperatures are higher and then you will have more pressures in weeds. Same thing with stand persistence after fifth harvest. You can see again, uh, less, a uh, little more than 20% at half inch and greater right up at 100% with the uh, four inch depending on your fertility. You can see the three fertilities uh, there with the different barcodes. But the bottom line to all this research is that cutting heights or grazing heights matter. And as we, especially cool season grasses, if we can stop at four inches, there's a lot of benefits both to the livestock and both to your bottom line pocketbook and also to the soil health. Here's another study where uh, they took uh, three and a half inches and one inch and they cut every 24 hours on the clipping for the one inch. Now the 3.5 inch rotational had 30 days rest prior to starting this experiment. So you take the three and a half inches and you start to let it recover after 30 days. So 30 days they rested and then they cut it down to three and a half inches. The one inch they just started cutting it and then uh, day one, day two, day three, day four, you can see the height of the uh, 3.5 inches is recovering much quicker than the half inch. All right, so it takes grass to grow grass. And again, photosynthesis. I want us to think about that leaf area. If we do not have leaf area, we cannot catch sunlight, which is an energy flow, not an energy cycle. And whether we're in cover crops or whether we're in grazing management, we have to have leaf area to catch that. When we have leaf area, it takes the sugar, which is the photosynthesis, the carbon, into the plant, into the roots, and then the exudates feed the soil biology. And this is a cycle for grazing management. If we overgraze, it shuts down. And I'll show you several slides where that system shutting down, no longer carbon is exchanged, soil biology shuts down, they die or they go dormant until we get this carbon. So this shows again that time to grow grass, you had uh, 40 days for the higher cut, the four inches, where the lower cut was uh, 64 days to that. So again, those studies uh, from Kentucky show we have to have grass in order to have grass. So the way to set yourself up for next year is to go down a certain level at about four inches instead of overgrazing. So in this uh, another study at Kentucky, root development is strongly re related to frequency and extent of leaf removal. So here's a study where they cut it down to two inch. So this is lower than we would recommend but they did the study on the left is cut to two inches every week, where the one on the right is cut to two inches every four weeks, and apparently the one in the middle is somewhere in between. But this is showing the recovery period. So by cutting to two inch every four weeks, you see a much more recovery of roots than you do to the cut a two inch every week. So I want you to think about if we're overgrazing down to two inches on a regular basis, which will be continuous. Um, grazing. So in that, those roots will be stubbed over. You don't have much sheath to, to collect the sunlight. So essentially we're stopping the carbon cycle and it's going to sit there status quo. And that's why we can take a rainfall simulator on an overgrazed pasture and show almost as much washing as we get into a cropland setting because the carbon system cycle has literally stopped. So that's the importance of having recovery time and going down to about four inches, but even down to two inches, if we do it less intervals, we can still have good recovery. And then one more slide to show all of this. So I'm taking a lot of efforts to show you the importance of this carbon cycle not to overgraze. 
We have these points here that grazing close at this stage, you can see that half inch, reduced spring production by over 25 to 50 percent. Available forage at this stage is less than 100 pounds per acre, less than one tenth of a bale. Animals cannot consume enough, so you might as well uh, feed hay at this stage and rest that pasture. You're not getting any benefits out of it, so it would be better to feed hay at this system than overgraze it and cause you detriment in the spring. Here's another study that's showing the uh, ergovalane levels from the endophyte fescue. And you can see uh, three plus inches. This is in uh, parts per million, I believe. And you can see at three plus inches, we're at 19. At zero to three inches, we're at 1717. And then as we go into the season, bottom line, the higher you have your height, the less ergovaline levels from the endophyte. So several things we can do with endophyte fescue. We can dilute it with legumes. We can bring in other species to dilute it. Or cutting heights or grazing heights can have a effects of some of the endophyte on there also. The, the, the bottom line to this, the lower the grazing height as you get closer to the ground, the higher the effects of the endophyte to cattle. So as you graze down to about four inches, you won't have as much negligible effect or negative effects from the endophyte than you would grazing closely. All right, and again, maintain forages and vegetative state. Again, if we're talking tall fescues, orchard grasses, rye grasses like that, five to eight inch would be a beginning height uh, and then height to terminate. I like four inches. This national said three inches. Bermuda grass, of course, uh, starting at five to eight inches, you can take it on down to two inches. And then native and warm season, starting at about foot and a half and grazing about eight to 10 inches. The grow on point in many of the warm seasons are six inches. So uh, whether you're cutting it for hay, grazing, you don't go below that or you start to lose your stand. Here's the impact on grazing pressures on soil organic carbon. And basically, uh, this is megagrams per hectare. I uh, converted that so it's a little over 850 pounds per acre that you can see as you get a, over that two acres per animal, you start to lose carbon. And this is getting back to those other, other slides. If you overgraze and that root system stops, then you no longer have the carbon cycle and your carbon will literally go down. So if we can keep enough acres per animal, and this is where you take your sticks and you do how much stocking you have and come up with your stocking rate. We don't want to uh, put too much heavy pressure or you'll see that picture in the top right uh, where it's overgrazed and we start to lose carbon. And again, it's all about sunlight, leaf area, and root growth in a grazing system. Here in a high performance per animal per cow, again, uh, Greg's taken this information and gone from acres per cow there at the top. It's normally animal units. But he's, uh, so he's saying anywhere from two and a half acres per cow up to about four acres per cow. That would be based on your productivity. That would be based on your rainfall, uh, your animals, your management, and all of that. So again, as your management increases, you can get more to that right, getting more to two and a half acres. I've seen some in Tennessee that will go two acres or less per cow, but they're moving it on a daily basis or twice daily. When they're doing that, they can go much heavier pressure, but the grass is still being rested at about four inches. They rest it for 45 to 60 to 90 days, whatever rotation they're in, and then with a the recovery period. So again, uh, it's good to, uh, when prices are up and down, as we know, you have your high stocking rate in the black line. You have your stocking rate adjusted to match low forage production in the blue line. And uh, that would be a good place to start out, to make sure you have the management skills also, and you have lower feed bill, and that's uh, where most of our expenses are. So a lot of the profit margin is based on that feed bill of hay. Anytime we can cut back on our hay, we're putting more uh, profit in our pocket. So start off with your 
stocking rate adjusted to match the low forage production period per year. Work through that as you bring in other species. You might can increase that, but you want to work through that. And because there's a fine line between maximum production and total disaster. And uh, what I mean by that is as long as we have grass and roots and that, we're, we're staying away from the disaster. But if we overgraze to the point where we do not have cover, we do not have active root growing, then we can have a total disaster there. All right, so manure, we know it improves the physical, the chemical, and the biological properties of soils. We, uh, the soil is less compacted when we have active carbon on the soil. Uh, it increases organic matter. Aggregate stability, the soil's ability to resist water pressure is better when we have organic matter or we have manures. So we see uh, fields that have grazing and non-grazing. We see a lot more biological activity. We see higher soil organic matter. I think when CRP came out in 1986, we should have taught them or we should have known better to say we need to be able to somehow referee that and not overgraze it, but to put animals on it because uh, we get a lot more organic matter a lot through, through grazing. You see all those other advantages, buffering capacity, a lot more chemical activity, cation exchange capacity, all of that by manure additions. And this is just showing the carbon cycle. Again, uh, everything I say today gets back to the sunshine, the photosynthesis, your plants, your pasture plants, they're going to respire CO2, which starts the carbon cycle again. Then the cows are going to eat the pasture. The rumens uh, and the uh, methane and all of that is going to be uh, exchanged for the CO2 and methane gas. And then the manure is going to eventually become soil organic material or it's going to cycle through the soil biology system and release nutrients into the soil. And that's when we get into this cycle looking at manure. We have the manure on the ground. It's mineralized by the soil organisms. And then we have what we call ammonium, NH4+. NH4+, we can have plants that would take up NH4+. You can have losses through volatilization at the ammonium cycle. And then we get into what we call the nitrifying of soil by organisms. And we take that from uh, ammonium to nitrite which is in the atmosphere or the environment very uh, quickly, and then we take it to nitrate. Once we get to nitrate, it's a negative ion. The soils are negative, so negative and negative, they repulse one another. So it's either going to leach, it's going to denitrify, or it's going to be taken up by the plant. So when we have nitrogen at this state, we want to have an active plant growing to take up these nutrients and that. And so we can have nitrogen losses due to erosion, to leaching and denitrification. That gets us to the nitrogen cycle, which covers this a little more detail. So whether we get artificial fixation through fertilizers, through manures or whatever, we start off with organic nitrogen. Again, the soil biology takes it to ammonium. And then we have nitrosomonas, which takes it to nitrate. Nitrobacter takes it to nitrate. It takes it up into plant, or it can leach, it can denitrify from that, so we can have losses that. We can have losses through er erosion. You can also have it removed by grazing, or you can have it removed by crop removal. So again, that's the nitrogen cycle. Now let's get into that plant. And as we know, carbon-nitrogen ratios are important in uh, cover crops and also grazing. And as you graze your plants at a smaller vegetative state, 8 inches, 12 inches, before it get, uh, gets into more of a reproductive state, you notice there's nitrogen in those leaves. Well, in a grazing system, we want to think about that carbon-nitrogen ratio, and you can see the growth of the plant. And again, we're still nitrogen. But then we have Gertrude coming by, and Gertrude is going to graze this. How they did this, I have no idea. But. So Gertrude grazes us down, and you see carbon in the roots. You see the little seeds in the roots. 
let's get rid of Gertrude there. All right, so you see the uh, you see the carbon in the roots. You see nitrogen in the plants. And again, this is the nitrogen and carbon cycle. And there's the carbon in the roots. And you can see that uh, the fast nutrient cycling, about 12 to 16 times a year as your grass roots slough off or naturally die, they're, they're replaced by new roots. We have this soil biology around here breaking this down, cycling nutrients, also, aggregating the soil, all the functions of soil is 95% soil biology. So in that grazing system, this is going on underground. So you have this carbon being released as these uh, microbes are starting to break this down. But guess what? If you don't close that gate, guess who's going to come back by? And here comes Gertrude again. And if we don't close the gates... She goes after that tender grass, and then she comes back and gets the other. So that's why we have to protect from uh, overgrazing. So now we have very low leaf area. We have high temperatures. We have excess moisture loss. Do you think that plant is now going to share carbon with the soil biology? That, that plant is in dire straits, and guess what? The little Mike the microbe and Billy the microbe and Jane the microbe, they die because there's lack of carbon being exuded from the roots, and so we have biologically soils start to die, and we have a much lower soil health with the grass basically just trying to survive, holding on all of its carbon, no longer cycling carbon, and no, the soil biology basically shuts down. So as you look below the soil surfaces, you have all this carbon being tied up to the plant, not being shared. So very little carbon exchange. And so then Sam, the microbe, and Sue, the microbe, are rest in peace. They die. So let's talk about the slow nitrogen cycle. Let's do the opposite. Let's grow our grass and not graze it, kind of like CRP or CRIP or something like that. So the plant grows, and you know as the plant matures, it goes from nitrogen to carbon as it starts to set seed. So it's putting all the nitrogen in the seed, and now the leaves are more carbon-based, and you know this as plants get mature, it gets much more lignin in it. It's less palatable. That's why we want to keep it in the vegetative stage and start the tillering of the grasses and all of this. So in the slow nutrient cycling, we have these leaves falling off to the ground. And as these leaves fall off the ground, guess what? Billy the microbe, Joe the microbe, Mike the microbe, they start breaking down this slow carbon cycle and they start to uh, release not they release nutrients from that as they break that down and this slide is just to show the ungrazed is this grass that has grown to maturity so once it grow, grows to maturity and you do not mow it you do not graze it you shut down the nitrogen cycle again almost similar to overgrazing where 30 days recovery you have again leaf area sunlight being intercepted sunlight energy flow intercepted, sugar goes into the plant, goes into the roots, exudes, giving 5 to 20 percent of that carbon to the soil microbes to cycle it, and then you're back to recovery. That's why we want to do a good job with grazing management. That's why we want to keep something growing all the time, because whether it's ungrazed and growing to maturity, the carbon cycle has stopped until you remow it, till you cut it, or something like that. That's why we saw underwear at Greg Brands eaten up in less than 30 days where it was grazing management compared to just left ungrazed. The underwear was not touched. Showing you there's a lot more soil biology in a grazing system when we do a good job with the management. Here are the four principles of soil health. First of all, we want living roots. This is cropland or grazing land. does not matter. We want to have living roots throughout the year. Again, intercepting the sunlight and uh, making carbon. We want to keep the soil covered. You saw on the one slide where we had the high temperatures when we overgraze. So anytime we take away the cover, 
we have high extreme temperatures in the summertime, low extreme cold temperatures in the wintertime. If you keep the soil covered, uh, biology is kind of like you and, my, you and I. They want to be, you know, good shelter, food, cover, and uh, so keeping the soil covered is important for our soil biology. Diversify. The more diversity we have above ground, the more of diversity we have below ground. And then managing more by disturbing less. What is a major disturbance in a grazing system? What is a disturbance in a grazing system? Overgrazing. Yeah, overgrazing. In a cropping system, it would be tillage or putting on excess nutrients or excess uh, fungicide or nemicide when you're not scouting, things like this. These are disturbances. So we want to manage disturbance as much as possible. We want to use those disturbance to take that grass down to a respectable height, say down to four inches or so, and then recover. So let's look at this. Rest periods allow for taller, more mature forage. And this is just some studies of some national folks, neighbor's pastor, and a guy, I believe he's from Missouri, Mark Brownlee. I don't know Mark Brownlee. I do know some names coming up. 2011 drought, you can see with typical overgrazing, what you would get. Mark Brownlee, who moves his cattle, I don't know if it's on a daily basis or a two-day basis, but he does move his cattle and he has good recovery time. And in, even in a drought, you can see Mark's pastures did not suffer anywhere like the neighbors by doing good grazing management. Again, you can see the differences in these systems. Again, diversity above ground gives us diversity below ground. Again, having systems, and I like what one of the farmers said outside. He said a lot of times uh, we worry too much about spraying a weed when there's a lot of diversity out there. And uh, I like what Greg Brand says. A lot of the weeds are opportunities. So you put it in the grazing system. You, uh, whether you mob graze, whether you, however you graze, where you put more pressure on that and uh, train them to eat some of these weeds and then we use them as opportunities and not worry about spraying them and things like that. So here's a mid-Atlantic grass lagoon mix, which would be similar to South Carolina or Tennessee. Midwest range, which would be more of a prairie type information. Uh, lamb's quarter would be considered a weed by most of us, but it actually has a decent protein content. So again, as we allow the cattle to graze that in a proper way, we can take advantage of the curly docks, the lamb's quarter, the Johnson grasses, and things like that. So you can see after grazing, before grazing, and you can see the cattle has literally controlled the weed through proper management there. And this is just showing the crude protein of plants. You can see uh, grass weeds like <coughs> Virginia wild rye, wild oats, cheat, little barley, and we see a lot of little barley in Tennessee where fields are, have been taken over by little barley. You can see the uh, nutrient content in that is very similar to rye, tall fescue, ladino clover, and uh, hairy vetch. <coughs> and then you can see hembic, Virginia pepperweed. Curly dock is one that has a lot of nutrients in it too. And of course, vegetative is also more uh, nutrient rich than toward the fruit period where it gets toward maturity. This is an area where uh, you might want to transition. So you got a pasture that is needing some help and you maybe do some overgrazing to get that ready. So that's where we want to use maybe a disturbance for our advantage. And then you might want to go to a temporary mix here. And here's raised crazy mix. And you can see these summer uh, annuals in this and uh, getting this ready for the reseeding in the fall. But you can get a lot of growth of animals and pounds per day off of this. So what about disturbance? We want to talk about the hoof, the plant, the manure, and the soil. So if you do overgraze, you want to do that for a transitional time. So let's say we're in, we have some endophyte fescue, we have a lot of weeds, we have some uh, weakness, we've been feeding hay there. So we do some overgrazing to get it ready, and then we replant 
our, our plants. But in an overgrazing setting, if we do this too much, you can see the ambulance here showing there's a lot of problems. This is what I see where I live in uh, Knoxville, right above University of Tennessee. I see a lot of grazing. You see a lot of pastures like this with a lot of weed growth in this. The d disturbance stimulates the weed populations. It reduces infiltration. So when we finally get a one inch rain, if we're only infiltrating 30%, 40%, then we're missing out on a lot of opportunities. So when we leave this grass at a higher height, we take in a lot more water. So it increases the soil temperature when we overgraze, diminishes the habitat of the soil engineers and other diverse soil organisms. And if we have time today, I will give you a presentation on soil biology that goes much deeper that you can tie back to your grazing management and see how soil biology can benefit you. And then we have effects of grazing animals on plant and soils. Notice cattle will do selective grazing. So the duration and time of grazing can, can uh, affect that. And then the frequency and the intensity of the defoliation, the sword pulling, the treading, effects on plants and all of that. So let's look at that. We know in uh, the buffalo, as they made their way across the prairies, they would come across and probably stop at a point where the grass was trampled down, where it had manure and urine on it, and then they would move on. And then the next year they would come back. There would be natural fires that would do this. But a lot of the soils across the United States were formed by these bison making their annual trek across this. Uh, so uh, through high, uh, we're going to look at a little bit about high intensity grazing. The bottom line is you select your paddock size. You select your grazing period, whether it's minutes or days or a couple of days or whatever the days of rest. And whether you want to go high grazing or not, I'm going to just show you some uh, benefits from this. If you go with a more intense grazing, you want to let the grass go a little more mature where that star is. We're in that rapid growth stage, stage two. In a normal situation, you would be early to middle of that. But if you're going high intensity, you want to get up to where that curve right before it flattens out at the growth phase two. Um, high density grazing, it will ideally 50, 50 to 60 percent would be consumed, 30 to 40 percent would be trampled, 10 percent would be standing. There's more litter for microbes, higher organic matter in on the soil, better manure, manure distribution, faster mineral recycling, more drought proof, more diversity of forages, and increased stocking rate. Now, some farmers, when they see this, they say, man, you're wasting some forage here. But keep in mind, all of that data that I showed you earlier, when we have recovery time, when we have our soil biology, when we have our organic matter, that is building up a bank account that this grass will cover much quicker when you leave a little bit to the soil like this, then this is going to feed the microbes and your soil organic matter is going to increase and your nutrient cycling is going to increase and your production is going to increase. So it's not wasted. It's, it's really putting in the bank. So high density grazing, this is, I think, uh, uh, NRCS or farmer, uh, ne uh, blah, 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 Doug Peterson uh, over in Missouri. And again, high amounts of animals per acre, 15 minutes apart. This is extreme. But again, the gist is putting manure down and grazing it to build soil health. Again, there's the beginning, there's the ending, and then that's what we have left. Uh, South Dakota, which isn't as much about us, but it's uh, again the same system where we take a lot of animals, we graze it, we rest it, we let the manure, the urine cycle, and then next year's growth is a lot hardier. Uh, so here's some uh, data that I want to share with you. And we got some data in Tennessee on some cropland where we brought some animals in. And I want to talk about some of this soil biology test. Has any of you heard on the, the PLFA test, phospholipid fatty acid, any heard, anybody's heard of that test? Some of the soil labs will, will offer this, but what they do, they run this on soil biology. So you get 
Uh, you get your total soil biomass. You get your functional groups like your tenomycetes, your bacteria, your fungi, your mycorrhizae. So this is where this is coming from. And uh, where there's no density and they're not doing a lot of grazing management, they had some decent numbers, 4,208 nanograms per gram. But notice by putting more manure and doing a good job trampling, they increased that by almost 2,000. And we saw some numbers as high in Tennessee as 6,000 when we brought grazing into a cropland. And we were more in that 4,200, which is a very good number. Nanograms per gram was total soil biology when we just had no-till and cover crops, but we brought animals over there. We had that 6,000 range. But in this grazing example, you can see they had more, uh, they had less atenomycetes, but everything else, they had much higher bacteria, much higher fungi, much higher mycorrhizae. And uh, mycorrhizae is an infection in the grass root or the corn root or the soybean root. And it is a horizontal growing, uh, we call it hyphae or mycelia, and it increases the roots by 10 times. So it's bringing phosphorus and zinc and water to that plant. So that's why mycorrhizae is important. So the bottom line to all of this, that left side, we have a lot more biology and different functional groups than the right side. So that is showing some benefits of this high density grazing. So let's look at impact of manure and urine cycling. Again, uh, Tennessee, we use a number about 85% is returned to the soil. I notice here they're using about 90%. What goes in the front end comes out the back end. So we want to take advantage of that. If we uh, concentrate our cattle, then you're going to get a lot of uh, phosphorus and a lot of nitrogen accumulated wherever you're accumulating those. That's why you want to do this a lot on a high area so you don't have these nutrients getting into your water supply but look at what manure distri distribution with with a rotation frequency in a continuous grazing it would take 27 years to get one pile per square yard in a 14 day rotation eight years in a four day rotation four to five years in a two day rotation two years to get one pile per square yard and then one day and twice a day we don't know, but we know it would be much uh, more distributed across there. So again, why not let the cattle do the work, let the sheep do the work, let the goats do the work, instead of us doing the work. So all of this ends up being money to our pockets by this good stuff. It's just not the end product of soil health. It's more productive soil, more productive cattle, sheep, goats, and then also healthier and then also more profit. So again, your manure piles, your urine, and then that's where they would be during the rotation. Uh, you can even have uh, infective larvae. When we get closer height, we want to keep that height again higher. We have less disease in that. Then we get into the dung beetles on manure management. And whether we overgraze or whether we do a good job of grazing, we'll still have dung beetles. That's not the point. The point is when we do grazing management, dung beetles can do a good job with distributing manure. We have manure dwellers. How would you like that job? Dwell, I mean, dwelling in manure. Well, how would you like to apply for that job? You, <laughs> a lot of us have to take a lot of crap anyway. All right, you have tunnelers and then you have tumblers. But this is just showing that above ground, in this particular dairy situation, you have 3,000 pounds of livestock above ground. But look below ground, you have 14,000 pounds below ground of all these critters. So the bottom line in a healthy soil, we have more below ground than we have above ground. So again, the soil life is very important and the uh, uh, features or the benefits that they provide us. And then you can have chicken on wheels. And uh, you would want to do this within three days after, about three days after you uh, move your cattle for them to get the larvae and some of the insects, dung beetles and some of that. So with that, that's the uh, end of my first presentation. And look at the wife talking, said your husband would be fine, Mrs. Lum Lumina. He was only grazed. So grazing is good. We want to promote good grazing. I know your coalition promotes this.
but we want to do a good job with our grazing management. Take a portion, leave a portion, let it trample in, let it distribute that manure and urine, let it cycle the nutrients and we'll get a lot more soil health.